Tonight, the fate of London Weekend Television, that's the commercial TV company that serves the London area, hangs in the balance. For tomorrow, the Independent Television Authority will decide its future. When Rupert Murdoch, the Australian newspaper owner, took in effect control of the company recently, hardly any of the executives who had formed the original company three years ago were left. Yesterday, two Labour MPs suggested in the House of Commons that the licence should be revoked under a discretionary power given to the ITA to take such a step when the nature or control of the company is fundamentally changed. Well, tonight in Australia, <coughs> Mr Murdoch, hopeful no doubt of keeping things as they are, announced that he subscribed to what he called the philosophy of LWT's original application, which now lies in ruins. It was in 1968 that LWT was born out of the reallocation of contracts that put an end to the licence to print money period of commercial television. In the north, Granada and ABC lost part of their area to a new company, Yorkshire Television, based in Leeds. Television for Wales in the west was replaced by Harlech. And in the London area, previously divided between ATV and Rediffusion, two new companies came into being, Thames Television and London Weekend. Thames, in fact, was an amalgamation of the old ABC and Rediffusion companies. But London Weekend, like Harlech and Yorkshire, was a completely new creature. Now, 132 weekends later, Barry Penrose looks back. On the 11th of April, 1967, David Frost and Aidan Crawley put their names to one of the most important documents in the history of British television. They wanted their consortium, London Weekend Television, to get the franchise to serve more than four million homes in London and the South East. They had the backing of some of the most powerful personalities in British industry and the services of a glittering array of top television talent. In the words of their confidential application to the ITA, These programme makers have been united by a common belief that the quality of mass entertainment can be improved while retaining commercial viability. Well, they got the franchise because they put up, and it's subsequently been publicised, a very elaborate tender suggesting that they were going to do balanced programs of high quality, they were going to bring current affairs into the weekend, they were going to have documentaries and drama and opera, all manner of things. And, of course, the people who put up this tender were themselves very accomplished program makers, uh, both from the BBC and from the other ITV companies. So it was a glittering array of talent. Now, of that array of talent, there isn't a shred left today, and of the kind of balanced programmes they were going to do, hardly anything survives. Perhaps the programme Aquarius, that's all. One of the central features of the original concept was a high-powered and ambitious public affairs department. But it achieved few of its targets. There was never enough airtime available for its programmes, and in the summer of 1969, the department was effectively closed down. We made two very important mistakes at the beginning. Uh, the first was that we tried to do in one sh weekend, the two and a half days that we had, a range of programming that could really only comfortably fit into a whole week. The second mistake we made was to assume that the audience had changed overnight in the way that we changed our program schedule overnight so that an audience which was used to getting a fairly bland, predictable schedule of programs every week was suddenly confronted with a completely unfamiliar range of programming, some of which was not taking any risks and some of which, which was, uh, was taking large risks. Financial pressures before long began to deter the company from taking major risks and their output became more conventional and familiar. David Frost turned increasingly to his own separate activities, especially in America. Then managing director Michael Peacock was sacked and that sacking led six program chiefs to resign. They complained to the ITA that the original charter for the company had been betrayed. It's at this point that the ITA were approached by all six executives. Uh, they were asked uh, to intervene, to look into the affairs of the company and to decide whether they were being properly conducted and to uh, see whether the uh, interests of the program makers uh, should in some way be protected. Uh, we felt at that time that we were arguing very strongly for the general standards of television, which was what we had thought to be the origin, original objective of London Weekend. Uh, however, uh, one had a definite uh, impression that uh, the ITA didn't really understand their job. 
it really was a very difficult uh, thing uh, trying to get the message over to them that this happened to be important. The program standards were important just as much as the company structure, the board of directors and the investors. But the answer that came from the ITA was very clear, that a, a commercial television company is primarily the board of directors and the investors and that the program makers, that is all the producers, the executives, the technicians and everybody else, even though they might be mentioned in applying for a license and even though they might be assets of a certain kind, do not rate when the chips are down. After Peacock's departure, his deputy Tom Margerson took over. He too failed to solve the company's financial problems. And last autumn, Arnold Weinstock pulled out GEC's financial support. Their shares were bought by Rupert Murdoch, proprietor of The Sun and the News of the World. Since Murdoch's involvement, seven more top executives have left, including Tom Margerson, leaving Murdoch at the helm and the ITA with a decision on its hands. weekend television and you're practically the sole survivor of the uh, shipwreck. Uh, now most of the rest of the crew in the executive uh, field have either resigned or got the sack. What went wrong? Well I think there were four things that no one could have anticipated really when we all started out, a, a merry bunch of uh, program makers. One was that uh, a strike would happen 30 seconds after we went on the air. There was a considerable drop in the advertising revenue and a, a switch to newspapers. Uh, the government at a certain stage increased the levy so that the money we wanted to make programs we hadn't got. And also the BBC uh, tended to uh, switch its commercialism to the weekend and programmed very strongly and very effectively <coughs> against us. Philip Whitehead, as an experienced television producer both for BBC and for commercial television and now your Labour MP for Derby North, would you uh, agree with that analysis? I'd agree with some of it, but I think beyond that, given that LWT had a shaky base, it also had immensely talented program makers. They were good competitors, they were good producers, they were good executives. People like Cyril Bennett, Michael Peacock and so on. All these people went in, then when the financial squeeze came on them, of course, nobody protected them and they were all thrown out. And from then on, LWT has gone steadily down. Why did... Uh, sorry, you wanted to say something? Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say LWT has gone steadily down in, in many respects because it is, you know, in many, as far as other companies are concerned, it's doing more than pretty well. Well, you let don't me think ask it's you, gone I just down in this to, last week? I just wanted to ask you this. Uh, in program terms? In no, terms I, of executives, management, morale of the company? No, the I events of this so. last week? I, you think they've boosted morale, do you? Philip, All these staring you straight fired? in the eye, I can yes. tell you that there is a buoyancy on the floor, on the shop floor at London Weekend Television at the moment. And I've experienced it because I've worked there over the last weekend. Why do you think, that's what I was going to ask you, why do you think that Yorkshire Television, which was also a new company and also had a kind of beguiling prospectus like you did, has done pretty well on the whole in the field of documentary and drama and the kind of promises that you were made, but that you haven't been able to fulfill these promises? In the field of documentary and drama, I yes. think we have, we may not have been successful with every programme that we've attempted, but our record of making programmes, making new programmes... Well, not the current programs, affairs field. You had a current affairs, uh, you were going to have current affairs on yes. Sunday afternoon and drama fact, on one night. Uh, 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 yes, uh, if we could put exist. it in perspective, it was Michael Peacock who wound up the current affairs field. It wasn't that we were doing no current affairs programmes, because Frost on Friday is a current affairs program and a very good one and a very commercial one. Is it coming back? Yes, sir. We'll answer that later in a couple of weeks well, time. Well I think we ought to know now. Yes well we this can't go one off one subject. Again which were in the original contract. Philip, can we come to that when I finished on this question? We, Michael Peacock wound that up and I think, in fact I'm very sure, that Rupert Murdoch will reinstate the public affairs unit in London Weekend Television. Could, could we come on to Mr Murdoch now, who is the sort of you know, new white hope of London Weekend Television? What makes you think, with his sort of record, the son of the news of the world, which are uh, popular papers but hardly quality ones, that he's going to do anything to improve the quality of London Weekend? Well, we only know in this country, people only know of his, his record in England. I mean, in Australia, he has a paper called The Australian, which is a first-class quality newspaper, and he runs that very effectively and very successfully. One of the things that we could do with that London Weekend is to get a little bit of that smell of success that came with a newspaper, The Sun, which nobody else had been able to make work. 
Well, I think of that swinging smell of success with Mr Murdoch's Australian television companies. We actually know what Mr Murdoch's television companies are like. We know what their schedules are like. We know that they don't put on much original material. We know that they are much worse than the new schedules being offered for London Weekend, with old films and repeats and so on. We're told that Mr Murdoch owns the world record in having the, the most old films on in one day. That gives me cause for concern. I'm surprised it doesn't concern the ITA. Maybe it does now. You've been to the ITA, Philip, uh, yeah. to, to ask them to revoke the licence for LWT. You've spoken in Parliament about it. Uh, don't you think that uh, Mr Murdoch should be given a chance to prove what he can do? Yes, I didn't want the licence revoked. What I would like the ITA to do is this. I would like them, first of all, to examine whether this contract is viable or not. Because obviously something of the problems which Jimmy referred to at the beginning is at the basis of the whole trouble. Maybe two and a half days in the London area just doesn't give you enough money. And if that is going to mean a deterioration in programmes and the constant sacrifice of executives time after time after time, obviously we've got to stop it, we've got to think again, maybe we've got to have a merger. If they think this is viable, what I would like them to do is to call in the franchise and then say to Mr Murdoch, all right, you had confidence in this company, we have certain reservations about you because of your newspapers and so on, but we will allow you to make a bid. Put up your programme schedules, put up the names of your, your executives. We don't even know who these people are at the moment. I don't know who's replaced Stella Richmond. Maybe Jimmy can tell us who the programme controller is. Well, the head of programmes at the moment who is, is the a, programme a man, controller? Rex Firkin, who I'm sure you know and has yes. a, a, has a that very name. excellent record. And who is the managing director? Uh, the general manager is Vic Gardner, who, who is, came from the shop floor in the is, industry, came from the BBC. And who is fact. the head of entertainment? A head of entertainment, we haven't one. But if you, if you think that somebody can just wave a magic wand, if you, know, if you know that little about the business, and produce the well, calibre of man that we want overnight, and maybe make a, a mistake, which is the last thing I think that anybody wants to do, because you're dealing with, you're dealing with human beings, uh, I think one needs time. All that has been seen at the moment is the people that are leaving. Well, Mr. Now Murdoch, comes the Mr. time. Mr. Murdoch didn't need much time to fire everybody. I mean, you've all got a dotted line around your neck at the moment, haven't you? Yeah, well, a manager really is entitled to choose his team. But th that, is the, that is the time when people are leaving. Maybe people who felt they couldn't work with him and they have every right to do just that. Not but now well, you must judge him on who he appoints well, and what right. his programmes are like. But there is a very serious point here, which is the, bo the body corporate of the company has changed significantly. It's changed in terms of all these programme people who've been thrown out, and therefore it isn't what was uh, suggested in the original franchise. Secondly, of course, the financial holding of the company has changed. There's no mention of Mr Murdoch and his interests, again, in the list of original shareholders. And thirdly, and there is another serious point, Mr Murdoch's Newspaper empire is sufficient, I think, to invoke section 12 of the Television Act, which says that when a newspaper proprietor has such holdings in a television company that they may endanger the public interest, then the authority should intervene. Now, I think may if I you look at... Well, that. just a moment. You've the news of the world... Could you be very quick? Yes. Could you be very the news quick? of the world is Mr Murdoch's main newspaper in this country, right? The news of the world has given a great deal of space to, to broadcasting this last two weeks alleged corruption of disc jockeys at the BBC and so on. It hasn't given any space at all to another scandal, that is the scandal of London Weekend Television. You can look through the, the news of the world and you won't see it there anywhere last week. Jimmy Hill. Could I just deal with the control that uh, Rupert Murdoch has at London Weekend Television? He has, in fact, 8.5% of the voting shares when you're talking about the Television Act. There are at least 91.5% of the voting shares out against him. So uh, that doesn't seem to me to be a position of control. What he brings to London Weekend, which it badly needs, you must well, let me say a few words, otherwise I shall never want to get in the House of Commons. Uh, it brings to London Weekend two things. Intense interest in, in programming and making a success of programmes and television and money which is badly needed. Now I think in return for those things, he, he deserves the chance to show what he can do. If you were to tell me that it's better for the industry and the people working in it, that London Weekend should be sick and have to go back to the ITA for treatment, then I would disagree with you. What I think is best for the industry is for us to continue this fight, make London Weekend work, and that will be good for everybody. I want to ask you this, uh, Jimmy Hill. Um, uh, do you think the ideals in this prospectus, which LWT originally put in, were pitched too high? Uh, I think um, in detail they were. Uh, yeah. that's, that's my retrospective view, yeah. and it's easy to look back. You see, what worries me is Mr Murdoch has quoted as saying tonight in Australia that he himself subscribes to those ideals. The now, how can he policy. subscribe to them and still get profitability when these people fail? The programme policy 
uh, is, is what, you know, and that's is very clear. That's in the appendix at the end, and the program policy itself, I think he still goes with, yes. and so do those of us that are in the company. We want to make it a good weekend. Well, there's no evidence of that whatsoever. Of course, you know, he's against sin. We all are. But he's in Australia. It's taken a parliamentary debate even to get this statement out of him, and I want to know why he isn't meeting the authority tomorrow. Philip Whitehead, Jimmy Hill, thank you both very much. Jimmy Hill and Philip Whitehead, Labour MP on the problems of London weekend television. <clears throat>